This is the Equid E-Commerce Show with your host, Jesse Ness, along with Richard Ote. All right, Richie, back to our happy Fridays. Loving that. Today, I think we have a very interesting guest or guests because we always talk about getting started really fast. Get going, get to your first sale, etc. And then there's the things that you skipped when you went really fast. So I think now there's a good time for people to think about their to-do list. You know, like when you have that day when you're, what should I do to help my business today? I think this is the to-do list. Yeah, there's some simple things that you need to do to get started. And some of the things you don't even think of, this is one of those topics that it seems like a small thing, but it turns out from the little bit I know about it that it's a pretty big thing down the road. Why don't you introduce our guests and we'll get started. Let's bring in our guests, Shane Morris and Megan Bauer. Shane, Megan, how are you? Great. How are you? Doing great and really excited to be here. All right. I know you're from GS1 US. Why don't you give us a little bit of who is GS1 US? Sure. We'd love to. A lot of people don't know this, but GS1 US is a not-for-profit and neutral supply chain standards organization. We develop and maintain the most widely used supply chain standards in the world. We were formed in the early 70s within the grocery industry, and what we were doing is trying to help them solve for long lines at checkout, pricing confusion at point of sale, and then quick price changes on the back end. So the solve for those problems is how most people do know about us as we are the official issuer and administrator of the UPC barcode, which believe it or not, is the cornerstone of the global supply chain. Our organization is federated, so GS1 US oversees members and partners that are operating in the US, but globally, we have over 1 million user companies and we execute over 6 billion transactions daily. If you want me to give you just a quick high level, because everybody's heard about the supply chain over the past couple of years, especially. And then we say we're supply chain standards and it's like, well, what are the standards? So just very quickly at a high level, they're built on three pillars. The first one of those is we have a system to uniquely identify all things in the supply chain. So for products, that would be the global trade item number, but we also uniquely identify locations, logistic units, and other things. The second thing within that system of standards is we have standardized data carriers that can capture that unique identity and associated information. So the UPC is a data carrier and it's standardized. And then lastly, once you have identity and the associated information captured, we have standardized mechanisms and languages that share that information across the supply chain. So the takeaway there is all the standards are interoperable with one another. They work globally and they work for any size business, big or small. And while our membership, it does include the Walmarts and the PNGs of the world. In fact, over 80% of our membership is small business and it's the fastest growing segment of our membership. So to give you a sense, GS1 US recently, you know, Shane mentioned the global trade item number, and we recently introduced something called the single GTIN, uh, whereby a company can license just one product identifier from us, as opposed to a pack, which is a little bit more costly up front and is the traditional way that we've done it in the past. But it's really aimed at that like small micro business. And in less than two years, we've added 30,000 new members by the single G10. Okay, that's awesome. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, so I'm going to give you a chance. But I think getting back to what I mentioned when we started the episode is that gets skipped when people start, generally speaking. So let's dive in a little bit. I get the barcodes, but give us a little bit of the difference between those. Yeah, sure. And we get this question a lot here at GS1 US. We kind of call it the alphabet soup. <laughs> so it definitely can get confusing. And especially because some of these terms tend to get used interchangeably, you know, out there in the world. But there are definitely some key differences. So the G10, as we mentioned, the global trade item number is a 14 digit number that's assigned to a product at the variant level, right? So for you, it's like a SKU. So item size, it's color, it's specific packaging, that kind of thing. That number itself is what uniquely identifies your product in the supply chain. And it's that number that we associate with your brand in our registry. And you can also list it on a marketplace or in your Google product listing as well. So a barcode is actually just a data carrier, right? You encounter them every day, like you said, at the grocery store. You can scan them in the form of QR codes on your phone. Uh, you also see them right on pharmacy shelving, and you might even have one on an ID badge you get. There are a series of generally black and white pixels or lines that have the ability to be machine read and communicate some type of information with the reader. 
So the UPC or universal product code is actually a type of barcode. It's the one listeners are going to be most familiar with, especially if you're in the U.S. because it's the thing that goes beep at the checkout at most stores. The UPC barcode carries the global trade item number. So when you scan it, the register will connect to a back end that will recognize the product by the GTIN and the back end system will say, hey, here's how much that product costs today. And the UPC carries a specific format of the GTIN, which has been shortened from that 14 digits that you're assigned to 12 digits. And sometimes when you're online in a marketplace, maybe ask for a UPC and they give you, you know, a text field, you can't upload an image. They are likely asking for that 12 digit format of G10. And that's sort of where the confusing part lies. Sometimes UPC gets used online that way. And if you're listening from Europe, you might be more familiar with the European article number or EAN, which is similar, but that G10 format would be 13 digits instead of 12. So you can sort of think of the G10 like a license plate number for your product. And the UPC is like the metal plate that it's hammered into. So the plate carries the number, but you can also put the number on a temporary plate or on your registration. And it's always going to be in a database associated with your vehicle and maybe many databases, depending on where you go in your car. I'm going to throw you for a loop now, though. The G10, the UPCs, it's been around for 50 years. And so everybody's familiar with it. And I think it's like Megan said, one thing it's important to understand is that GS1 standards, so the, the G10 and the UPC barcode, they're technology agnostics. And the UPC is a great example of that because it's been around so long. But that number that's embedded in a barcode can be embedded into other data carriers as well. So everybody's familiar with UPC barcodes, but barcodes are also created in 2D, which are essentially a QR code that we're all super engaged with right now. And so GS1 is spearheading an industry initiative within the retail community called Sunrise 2027. And right now we're literally working on having checkout systems ready to read 2D barcodes by 2027. It's a huge change. This 2D barcode can, is going to be able to do a couple of different things. So the first thing it's going to be able to do, we have a standardized format called GS1 Digital Link. So it can replace the UPC barcode at checkout for price lookup, but it can also carry a lot more information than just that number. It can carry batch lot information, expiration, best sell by dates. It's the information it can carry is almost limitless. So it solves for that B2B transaction, if you will, but then it's also smartphone scannable. So for example, let's say a food item can link back a web page to that specific product. So it land on ingredients, recipes, where to buy any additional information that they choose. So it's going to solve again for the B2B purposes of it, but it's also going to be able to be consumer facing as well. So like I said, it's a big change and it's underway now on the retailer side. So look for that in the next five years. All right, we get a little taste of the future there. A little shout out to our mobile team, by the way. This will be our little commercial. The mobile app has the ability to read the UPC. I thought I'd give you, everyone a heads up that, that helps load into your store. So we talked a little bit about the retail. Now, most of the people listening here are probably online only sellers or online first. How is the G10 relevant in e-commerce? That's a great question. One thing we like to say here at GS1 US is the G10, it bridges the gap between the physical and digital worlds. So among other benefits, they can be used to boost search engine optimization. They can prove a brand's authenticity online, and they can also be used to create unified analytics across multiple channels. And most people sit on, you know, different places today. If you think about it with the internet, in the increasingly crowded endless aisle. Search engines, marketplaces, shopping engines, and retailers, today they rely on GTINs for the billions of products that they're indexing in order to accurately identify and return the correct information, web page, or image to the consumer. So what we wanted to do is kind of highlight four key benefits in the e-commerce space where the G10 really serves a purpose. So the first one of those is going to be SEO. So if you think about a new brand and their journey, a request for a G10 or UPC from a marketplace or from Google might be the first place a new business is going to encounter GS1 standards. They don't even know, you know, it is a GS1 standard. But assigning G10s to your products when listing on Google Marketplace or on your webpage through structured data can significantly improve search results. It can improve impressions and conversions. Google has actually been advocating for brands to associate a G10 with their product listing since 2015. And they state that it can increase your conversion rate by 20%. And you know, listing your products on Google Marketplace is free. It's a powerful tool. 35% or so of all product searches happen, start there. And then if you assign G10s to your web pages through structured data, and that's a lot of times 
going to potentially be done through an SEO company, but that also helps search engines categorize your products and web page and will augment its placement in the search results. We also want to talk a little bit about interoperability. So since GS1 standards are global, they can be used across global systems and 3PLs are a great example, right? As you expand your business, a lot of businesses start using a 3PL, third-party logistics providers. 3PLs want an identifier for your product and they often want a barcode that they can scan at intake to help with that process. And if you don't provide it, they're going to use the identifier that they assign in their internal system and give it to you. Might not mean that much to you, but when you start expanding, right, if you expand to three different warehouses and they all assign your product a different identifier, that's a little confusing, but probably still manageable. But when you have 10 products and each of those products comes in five sizes, it kind of gets exponentially confusing. So 3PLs can work with G10s. They can scan UPC barcodes. And now you only need to manage your inventory in the amount of identifiers you actually have for products. So at the same time, that G10 is in your website backend, it's on all the marketplaces you list for really seamless data collection between your sales and your inventory. And if you want to be really extra nice to your 3PL, you can use another GS1 standard called the GS1 128 barcode, which can tell them what's in the barcode, what's in the carton, how many of those things are in it, and a bunch of other things that might be really relevant and useful and help save them time at intake, which saves you money. <laughs> and you can use those same standards at a warehouse in the U.S. or a fulfillment center anywhere in the world. So we have SEO, interoperability. The third is on marketplaces. So a lot of direct-to-consumer sellers will list on marketplaces. They might start direct-to-consumer, but then they start pivoting and diversifying where they want to be. And a marketplace is a common next step. And why wouldn't you, right? 34% of product searches start on Google. 46% start on Amazon. I like to compare listing on a marketplace as kind of a hybrid B2B scenario. So you're not just going direct to consumer. You are in a way, but as a brand, in order to list on a marketplace, you have to be approved to list, and then you have to follow their requirements in order to get your products published. So you're going to be competing with a lot of other like brands and a lot of other like products. And you have to make sure that your products stand out as authentic and they are what you say they are. Well, today, still, some marketplaces are like the Wild West. Anybody can list at any price, and there isn't a lot of governance as far as what products are actually being sold and shipped. But there are marketplaces out there, Amazon being one, who are very consumer-centric, and they want to ensure that customers coming to their platforms will be dealing with legitimate brands who sell legitimate products. You know, for a long time, even pre-internet, the retail industry has put standards in place to ensure this same legitimacy. So one of these standards is the G10, the Global Trade Item Number, where they require brands to license G10s from the chosen authority, which is GS1 US, and associate their products with these numbers. When a brand does this, one of the benefits is their product will be linked back to their company and can be verified if a marketplace or a retailer chooses to do so. So it can be verified. And what it also negates is bad actors from making up numbers or sourcing from third-party sellers. And it also negates them from hijacking existing listings, which happens out there in the marketplace. So it gives marketplaces a peace of mind to know that the products are authentic to the company listing them, and they can be verified if need be. And I'm going to kind of try to tie it all together with our fourth point, which is that the G10 is really essential for an omni-channel strategy. And while we know that there are many businesses that are direct to consumer and aim to stay that way, the reality is that most businesses want to be everywhere their customers are. And we're seeing it even with notable D2C brands, right? You can buy a Casper mattress in Costco now, as long as you can win a battle for one of those flatbed cards. <laughs> so having a GS1 G10 for your product will really open just so many doors to different retailers and marketplaces that require them. And it's a pretty small investment. Single G10 is $30. And if you are buying a pack of G10s by licensing a prefix, it's just going to get less expensive per product from there. So, you know, think about it. At most, it's $30 per product to be able to sell on Amazon, in Target, in Walmart, department stores, et cetera, all while gaining this great SEO advantage. Also, you know, for those entrepreneurs that are building a brand with the eventual goal of selling, Due diligence early on is really important, and GS1 issued GTINs are one really little inexpensive part of the growth potential. Yeah, that's a good rundown. I personally have some experience with some of these things where I didn't do that, and I have some products that I didn't assign a proper SKU. I started using them from other vendors, and then I had like two or three 
and then I created my own later. And so now I have these massive spreadsheets. There's just a bunch of numbers trying to compare stuff. So I wish I would have known this several years ago. I just would have made that process much easier. So this does happen. The hijacking does happen all the time. Good tips there. I have a question. I'm an Equid by Lightspeed user right now. I haven't done this yet. Can I still do it? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Like, is somebody sitting there going, oh my gosh, all these acronyms flying by, like I didn't do any of this. What are all <laughs> those things? Sounds super important. I mean, you got SEO, you got interoperability, you got marketplaces, you got omni-channel. By the way, interoperability. So you're telling me we heard it today. We're going to be able to sell them the metaverse too? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <That's> the, <laughs> the question is, it's not too late. Someone who hasn't done it yet, this is something that not only they can do, but they should do, even if they haven't done it when they started. Absolutely. Yeah. It's never too late to start. And we go out of our way to really try to help people at any step in their journey. If you've had some challenges or made some choices you wish you could undo, that's fine. The point is to start the right way as soon as you can. And I think just to add on to that as a Equid by Lightspeed brand, and you're starting out and you're just going direct to consumer, a lot of times when they go to list their product catalog on your platform, they're going to ask for a SKU. And most every brand is going to have a SKU. It's an internal proprietary number. And so if you're just going direct to consumer, it works great. The global trade item number, as soon as you start to pivot and scale, that's when it becomes really important. So that G10 is really more of an external facing number that all the business processes and systems of everybody else can read. All right. So we know we need a G10. How do we get one? Do we need to sign up for membership? What's the next step? Pretty straightforward. We do have an online store. So you can just come to our website, gs1us.org, and you'll have two options. You can either license a single G10, which I mentioned, you know, right at the beginning, or you can license a prefix. And what a prefix is in your G10, the first couple of digits will identify you as a company. And then the next couple of digits will be assigned to the product as opposed to a single G10 where you just get one number. And those packages for prefixes go from anywhere from 10 to 100,000. So you really have to look at your business and decide what might make sense for you, whether you go with a single or a pack in any of that size range. Shane, anything to add on there? We do have a member support team. They're phenomenal. So whether you're a member or just somebody who's sitting there thinking like, oh, geez, I need to look into this. They're a great resource to have. They sit in the United States. They're live people. You can actually call them or email them. If you go to our website, you can get that phone number. They'll answer the phone within a minute. They'll respond to an email no longer than 48 hours. They're super engaged with all the questions that are coming to them. So for sure, call them and talk to them if you have questions. Got it. Makes sense. Will do. Now we know about gs1us.com. Dot org. Okay, good. Good catch. <laughs> All right. So you guys are on these podcasts. How else do you work with the e-commerce community? So our membership is made up of companies of all sizes, like we've talked about. So from the micro and small business to large corporations, and we are member driven. We keep kind of hammering that home. So our organization works hard to listen and respond to the things that our members are telling us. So the whole reason that our team was formed and our team is Megan and I was as a result from listening to our members. So if you think about e-commerce and the evolution and change that has happened over the last 20 years, one of the significant changes is the ecosystem of enablement companies that have bubbled up to help e-commerce sellers optimize in the various channels. So your company is a great example of that. Most people aren't building their own websites today and just launching out online. You need expert help from these different companies. GS1 US realized that although we had relationships with many of the brands and companies, we needed to engage with companies like yours. So you're not necessarily members, but you're the ones out there talking to and helping these brands navigate the online retail on a daily basis. So essentially you become these brands trusted advisors. And so they put our team together to come in and help you help them navigate these retail waters for our piece of the puzzle. So we found we can reach a lot more brands working with companies like yours. So your subscribers and customers can solve from issues from their trusted advisor in your environment. They don't have to leave your environment and now they're out in the interwebs and going down a lot of different rabbit holes. So that's one way that we're working. And I can give a little bit more specifics on that too. We have great educational content for our members and for anyone considering becoming a member. We do have GS1 USU University. I know you guys also have Equit Academy. So 
lot of similarity there. We have videos on YouTube with quick guidance and that kind of thing. And what we're really trying to do is take some of that education and provide that content to solution providers like Equid by Lightspeed to live in your resource pages. As Shane said, so many businesses rely on the educational content you provide, not just to answer the questions they have, but to help them learn what they need to do next. So we can also conduct webinars and obviously we can hop on podcasts as well. We're all, we're trying to demystify GS1 standards. And GS1 US does have its own podcast. It's called Next Level Supply Chain. And we're actively recruiting guests from the e-commerce solution partner community because we're really hoping to be able to talk about standards in the context of online businesses. Okay. I think that sounded like an invite. I'm available. Um, <laughs> Come on, okay. my Jeffy. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. All right. So that makes a lot of sense there. And by the way, for people listening, we've already fixed up some of our help sections and things things like that from this outreach. So I think this becomes way more helpful for people that are setting up their business. You know, I think takeaway for me is that, yeah, when you see this UPC as you're setting up a new product, easy to skip that or just put in 00001. Hopefully you're giving us some pause here and say, okay, this number might live on for the next five or 10 years. Maybe let's do this right. I will tell you that our emails say the next step should be go to go set up your Google merchant account and set up Google shopping and they're going to ask for a UPC and so on and so forth. So just think about that and do that the next time. Richie, what did we miss here along this discussion? Looking at it from just interpretation standpoint, the person who's sitting there and here's a bunch of acronyms flying by, this is important. Our car VIN numbers, vehicle identification number. It's telling you it's this kind of car, it's this year, it's this color paint. This is just that for your products on the internet. And when you want all the different marketplaces and all the omni-channel experience that customers could be coming in from to be able to communicate exactly what it is you have and not to be misinterpreted in any way, shape, or form, this sounds not only important, but it sounds like it could actually benefit you, not just not hinder you in some scenarios where you might not be able to get on a marketplace if you don't have this or use some other company that might not set it up right for you. You want to do this right because this sounds like it could actually be very helpful. What are <laughs> your social channels, websites, and I'll make sure I put them in the show notes. Absolutely. So our website is gs1us.org and you can find us online on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. And just a reminder that podcast Next Level Supply Chain, you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Oh yes, we also have a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll look for that. We're just going to share that with our audience. Shane, Megan, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Everybody listening, get out there and make it happen. Bye, everybody. Hey, this is Jesse and Rich. We want to let you know we really appreciate you listening. We hope you find the tips we give you helpful for growing your business. You can find all of our past episodes and a lot more useful stuff at equi.com forward slash podcast. And also check us out on your favorite podcasting platform like Apple Podcast or Stitcher and make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing. Be sure to let us know what you think by rating and reviewing so we can serve you better. So subscribe on your favorite platform and come join our community, check out the transcripts or tell us why you would be a great guest at equid.com forward slash podcast.